me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to take one verse this morning. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We used this verse last uh, week and we'll be using it for the next several weeks. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. We'll pretty well have it memorized before it's all said and done. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today. We are, as a nation, far from you. And even those of us who feel that we're close to you, we're further away from you than we realize. It's time for us to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and to repent. Show us, Father. Teach us. Draw us back to you as only you can. Grant us your wisdom, your understanding, and grant us your tender heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our restored relationship, which is what we're wanting to have with God, must begin, as we said last week, with humbling ourselves. With humbling ourselves. But humility must will always lead us to prayer. We have to approach God. We have to come His way. Everyone prays. Everyone prays. Given the right circumstances, even pagan idolaters will humble themselves to approach God in prayer. And there is really no atheists in the Foxo. I've met too many people who were in the military when the bullets started flying and, and their life was on the line. That's when they cried out to God and they were saved. And though they had lived a, a godless life prior to that, they gave their lives to Jesus then and began following Him. But we're not pagans. And we're not atheists. We are Christians. We are Christians. We are called by His name. The name of Christ. It literally means Christ partisans or little Christs. Little Christ. We, it was a slur that we took as a badge of honor. In our day and age, it's just a name. Way too often. It is time for us to humble ourselves and pray. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. We've drawn in the bulletin. You have a picture there that has the four petals of the dogwood tree flower. And I put on there the four things that are necessary for us to make uh, to see our relationship with God restored and a re revival actually to break out into our country. If we don't do it, it won't happen. And so we have to begin. So how do we do it? How do we begin? Hosea said to God's people in his day, Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away all iniquity. And receive us graciously, so we will render the calves of our lips, so we will praise you. That's what he was saying. From where do the words come? Where do the words come? Now, they should come from our hearts. You understand that? It should not be very hard for us with our hearts to begin to cry out to God the right words that we ought to say. And I know we, we sometimes fumble and bumble and we... We, uh, we mix our words up and we say things that 
uh, in our private prayer that we, uh, we wouldn't want to be made publicly known. But God wants to hear from us. Our relation with God requires us to communicate with Him. And we lose all our strength and power when we cease to communicate with God. And it is a two-way street. We speak to God in prayer and God speaks to us both in His Word and by His Spirit. And we need to get back to that. It should come from our heart, our humble heart. But if our heart is not humble, then we must begin by praying for God to give us a humble heart. You say, I thought we talked about humility last week. Yes, we did, but we have got to have a humble heart for God to give us the uh, right prayers to pray for us to do that. This is God's desire for us. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. In other words, he'll give us a tender, humble heart if we'll just begin asking for it. It is that. If that is what the Father desires, then ask him to give us a humility that we, do, we need and a tender heart to draw near to him. Just to draw near, to get close. Uh, you're going to hear it soon because I've gotten recorded the the, uh, the song that I often quote. Uh, I, I, as the days go by, uh, I hope I don't say the same. I want to get so close to him on the day that Jesus calls me my name, uh, there won't be that big a change. And that's the way it should be. But we need that time to humble ourselves before God. Then in prayer, ask God to guide your way back to Him. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. This is a prayer I pray every morning, every morning, because I, I know, you know, just like the song that we sing, Come Thy Fount, that second verse, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. I want that relationship to be uh, good and, and submissive to Him. And if we have been deceived by the darkness of this world, and let's admit it that we have been, we have to begin there, uh, pray that God will guide us with His light. We need the light to guide us to where He wants us to be. Pray God's Word back to Him. And I've been emphasizing it here lately. But there's no scripture in the Bible that you cannot turn around as a prayer toward God and to pray His Word back to Him. Let your heart be tender and submissive to know and to do His will. That's in prayer. As God's people, we must begin to confess both our sins and the sin of our nation. We could say sins, but it's all group. It's all together. Our nation is in the midst of sin. Not sins. Sin. We have a rebellious heart against God. And all around us we see it. You look over uh, into some, uh, well in our state alone, but, but you can look at some other states and it's gone over the deep end. I mean, when did we decide that we could change God's uh, genders that he has given us, male and female, I think I heard this last week, to 28 new genders? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And now they're, they're trying to take out of the medical books the terms male and female. Out of medical books. And we've allowed this transgenderism to so invade us. It's, all, it's becoming a joke. <laughs> With all this COVID going on and everything, uh, somebody said, they said, I'm self-identifying as a person who's already got the vaccine. <laughs> that's silly, isn't it? And yet that's how far we've gotten. 
And we're, there's no call from anybody in the upper echelons of our government uh, for a national day of repentance and prayer for our nation with all that is going on around us. There's no been a call for that. What is wrong with us? We have forgotten God. Our own sins separate us from the God that we love. Our own sins, broken fellowship with God can only be restored by honest confession. And I love that, that verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that because it's a promise from God if we'll just confess not only the Will you forgive the sin that we confess? He will forgive the sin that we don't even know about. And if we're honest, there are sins that we're not even aware of in our life. We've gotten so far from God. I think most Christians, when convicted of their own sin, will are ready and willing to confess their sin. When they're convicted of it, uh, Brother Charlie, who has been here, uh, he... Uh, Gives us as a testimony. Brother Charlie, you smoke. I think he told us he started smoking at what? 12? Yeah, something like 12, 12 years 30. of age. And he smoked for 20 years or more. And uh, somebody in his church said, Brother Charlie, you really need to quit smoking. And he said, when God convicts me that it is wrong, I will lay the cigarettes on the altar and never take another one. Never pick up another one. And he was convicted. During a revival meeting, he set it on the altar and never went back to another cigarette. Never. We're willing to do that. The difficult part is confessing the sin of our nation. Because many of us feel like, I'm not a part of that. I'm not a part of this gender thing. I'm not a part of the, the gay marriage. I'm not part of, of promoting the gay lifestyle. I'm not a uh, part of pro promoting the drugs and the alcoholism and and, and uh, so many other things that just completely out, things are completely out of hand. I've not turned my back on God. I'm a patriot. I, I salute the flag. I, I, I bow uh, my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't feel like that I need to confess somebody else's sins. But we have too many examples in the Bible where that happened. We have the example of David in chapter 51 of Psalms where David confessed his sin with, with Bathsheba. And the repentance that he shows in that chapter is a great example for us. But we also have chapter 9 in Daniel, and it's convenient to remember this, and chapter 9 in Nehemiah, where there, as they're getting ready to dedicate the, the temple to, to service of God, they confess the national sins, beginning all the way back past Egypt when they were there and come all the way forward to the day that they were and confess their sins. We have those examples before us. The Bible tells us that Daniel confessed the sins of Judah. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. That's what he said. That is the, the thing that we need to do. Our nation has multitude, multiple sins. I mean, folks, they're, they're pushing abortion again. I'm not talking about that to allow women to abort their babies. That's already going on. What they're pushing now is if you're a medical doctor or you're a nurse in a hospital and you... Uh, uh, they, there's somebody comes in and they want an abortion and you say no, you're violating their civil rights to have an abortion. And you can be charged with a crime. Now what happened to the freedom of conscience? Is it everybody else's conscience that's free, but not for the Christian who believes that life begins at conception? What is, what's wrong? There's something wrong there. That's the sin of our nation to this day. The millions of babies that have been aborted. And we could go on and on. We could list those sins.
But as a nation, we have sin, and we need to confess those sins to God. Now, that's a difficult thing to, to do. That's a difficult thing to do, but we need to do it. Then we need to pray that God will deliver us from the power of sin and judgment. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Psalm 79, verse 9. In our weakness, we can find our strength in humble, or if you want to call it humble, dependence upon God. Dependence upon Him. You see, that's where all sin begins. I've told you recently that I've been, uh, I went through, I've gone through the Old Testament now twice. I'm starting the third time around. And the sin of Babel was not that they made a tower. The sin of Babel was they were trying to make a name for themselves that would be above God. And folks, we have gone that way in our country. We pat ourselves on the back in thinking that we are so great and so strong. But we need to become weak. The greatest blessing to the, of the world at that time was when God confused the language of the people. And they stopped building that stupid tower. And then after that, if you follow along in the chronology there, we get Abraham. We get Abraham. And Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. And Abraham begins following the Lord. He's one man. What's everybody else doing? Idle here, an idol there. If you go to India today, they tell me that they have 300 million idols. 300, not 300 statues, 300 different, 300 million different idols that they worship. And they, they have family idols, they have just all over, they're worshiping these statues. They're worshiping these uh, pagan deities. And folks, they are no better than, no worse than we are. Because we choose the idols of our own making. You know, uh, we got a new kid at work, and we had this guy pull in uh, in a pickup, uh, not pickup, pull in a Corvette. And I, I saw him drive across the parking lot. I looked out there and everything. And out ste stepped this guy with a cowboy hat on. <laughs> and I told him when he came in, I said, uh, 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 where are you putting the hay? <laughs> he laughed. He said, well, my wife will let me get... Uh, there some things but she won't allow me to put hay in that, that Corvette. <laughs> so, you know, but that, that boy, he was, oh, wow, that's my car. That's, that's the one I want. I, I, he said, I can tell it from a mile away what model it is and everything. He had, there's his idol. Okay? And some people idolize other things. But they, they're no different from, than those in India and some of the other pagan areas around the world. We need to put our dependence back upon God. We are weak. I should let me rephrase that. When we are weak, then we are strong. Paul said that of himself. When I'm weak, then am I strong because God's power is able to work through me. We need to depend upon Him and uh, put our... Uh, trust in the Almighty. I mean, His name is Almighty. That means there's, He has all power. And He committed all power to Jesus when He commissioned us. And He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. We have the power of Jesus behind us. We need to be able to use that power, but not our own. It's His. And his alone. We live to God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
there's a phrase after that. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I'm not even going into that phrase. I just want to point out the fact that God can do it exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Now you meditate on that a while, and then read the other phrase. Because it's important to us. But let God be God in us, His servants. We want revival, and we want restoration to our country and to our people. Then we must turn to the only one who is able to deliver us. And that is God the Father. Who works when we pray? Who works when we pray? Is it our work or is it His work? If it's the work of God our Father, then to Him all the glory goes. There's nothing that, you know, there's no one to pat us on the back and say, oh, you did such a great prayer. You just... You know, let me say this because it is, I know it's true. We get the idea sometimes that prayer is like the pagan incanta incantations. That you say the right words and you say it the right way and it you it's a spell that you cast upon God and God will do that because you, you do that. No, God doesn't hear your words as much as he looks upon your heart. And his will is always going to be done. And if we are going to be submissive to him, and if we are going to begin to pray to him, we've got, I, I love it, folks. And I love the blessing that came to me when I realized that I could go to God and pray, My Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's no longer what I do. It's what he does because he's God. And he's my father. And when we go to God in prayer, we go to God in prayer to the one who is our father. Not just God, but our father. And even when we pray, that too is to for the glory of God. He alone is worthy of honor and glory because He alone is God. And we say that with our lips, but we don't live it with our lives. We think that somehow or another there's some dependence upon ourselves to get it done. It's just like the you know when you're witnessing to someone. I, I've given up trying to convince people that they're lost and they need to be saved. Paul didn't do that. Oh, he, he tried to persuade men, but he, he didn't worry about the fact that they didn't understand this. They need Jesus. And until they come to Jesus, they're not going to be saved. We have to start depending upon God. In John chapter 6, we were reading it just here recently, there are two things there he said that all who are taught of God will come to him. And two, no man comes to Jesus except the Father draw him. That was. That's interesting. Uh, but remember, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And then we put the amen on the end. Let us pray to God, our Father, to Him who alone will be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all generations, all ages, world without end. Do that. You know, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, most of you would raise your hand and say, and say, I've got loved ones who are not, who are far from God, who are lost. We'll use the old fashioned term that uh, those raised in church understand. Lost means they're on the way to hell. And folks, we need to get praying for them. 
And if you've been praying for them, don't give up. Don't you think God wants to save them? I mean, I don't know how this works. You know, God, if God wants to save them, are they strong enough to defeat God and not be saved? I haven't figured that out. I know that we're given free will. And your, your loved one's given free will. We, you know, there's none of this taking and putting their hand behind their, or their arm behind their back, forcing them down the aisle to make a confession. That's not salvation. That's forced. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. And we love them. And maybe you have, as I have to, to some of my loved ones, talk till I'm blue in the face and, and they still will not hear. Then who will they hear? They've got to be taught of God. They've got to be drawn by God the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says when they come to him, he won't cast them out. I, I, I just don't know how it works, but I know that the promise is there. And we need to be praying for those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll never be able to say before God, you didn't save me because I couldn't be saved. If you're never saved, you wind up in hell, it's because you made a choice not to put your faith in Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world, verse 17 says, to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now folks, that's the God that we serve. And he wants everyone saved. And if we do nothing else, if, if this whole nation goes to hell in a, a handbasket, as some people have said, then at least let's get on our knees and for those who we love, pray for them to be saved. To pray for them to be saved. And it any opportunity that God gives us to give them the gospel message. And if they won't listen to us, then let's be an ambassador for Christ and tell somebody else's child or loved one who needs to hear the message of the gospel, how they can be saved. And though we have no strength, no power at all, God is still God. And he will save those who will hear and believe the gospel. And if you haven't believed, today is your day to believe. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from your unbelief. And turn in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll save you and he'll make you God's child. He'll do that. Isn't that wonderful? You get up. You go through your daily life and you hear a message about salvation and the Holy Spirit convicts you in your heart and you, in a moment in time, cry out to God in faith and the Lord Jesus saves you and makes you a child of God. What greater miracle is there than that? That's what happened on the day I got saved. I mean, I went to church that Sunday morning. I, I was not planning on making a profession of faith. I was still resisting the Lord. And before that day was out, I was his child. C.S. Lewis, which a lot of people quote in this day and age, says of his salvation that he got on the bus going to work at the, the college got old an atheist and got on a Christian, off a Christian. Now that's how, how God works. Now he wasn't saved in a church. Where was he saved at? He was saved on a stupid bus in England. And God has saved so many. 